Let's pray. Lord, those little ones that are heading to a place where they'll be taught about you. We first pray for them right now, Lord, that you would bring them to that point of faith where they trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. God, we pray that you'd bless their hearts. Lord, we pray for their protection in this very dark world, Lord. And then, Lord, we pray for us in the here and the now on this Resurrection Sunday. Lord, enable all of our eyes, the eyes of faith, to gaze upon you. Lord Jesus, I ask for your help in putting me in the background. Lord, we all just want to see you. We all just want to hear from you. Lord, we commit this time. Lead us in the presence and power of your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, breathe your life in every single one of us today. You know our hearts. You know our very souls. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Well, on this Resurrection Sunday, we are putting an exclamation point on our series, Jesus, the Resurrection and the Life. That's who he is. Jesus is, think about this, Jesus is the Resurrection and the Life. And it was at the cross that he became sin for us that we might be the righteousness of God. And it was the resurrection of Christ that has put it all into effect for us so that God now gives us the gift of righteousness. Listen, a forever right standing with him, God gives his righteousness to any and to all who place their faith on his son, Jesus Christ. It's a gift. God justifies freely the one believing in Christ by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This is why the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is God's greatest gift to you and to me. With that being said, I will also say that if you personally have not trusted Christ, you personally have not trusted in his sacrificial death for you on a Roman cross, and you personally have not trusted in Jesus in his resurrection from the dead, which defeated death for you, if you have not personally and fully trusted in Jesus Christ, let today be the day that you do. Let today be the day that you personally believe in and receive Jesus Christ himself as your risen, living Lord and Savior. And it really is true. Jesus is the ultimate rescuer. And he will rescue you in the ultimate sense, but you must trust him. And then for those of us here today who have believed in Christ and are doing our best to live by faith in Jesus Christ, let today, let this Resurrection Sunday be the day where our faith in him is so built up, where our faith in him is so fortified where we are so strengthened in our faith that we are so greatly, greatly, greatly encouraged that we walk out of here today with mountain-moving faith. Now, for the sake of discussion, we ask the question, how? How is the death and resurrection of Christ God's greatest gift given for you and for me? And first, we need to understand that the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ was set from eternity past. Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, a verse that we touched on last week, describes Christ like this. Describes him as the lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. What? What is this revealing? 
it reveals that Christ's coming and Christ's death for our sin has always been, always been God's plan. When John the Baptist pointed to Jesus in John chapter 1, verse 29 and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That truth right there, that truth is in reflection of what God the Father and God the Son had always had as the plan. And then there's Isaiah 53. Isaiah written some 700 years before the coming of Christ. Listen to the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 53 verses 2 through 6. Listen to what he says. He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised. And we held him in low esteem. And certainly he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds. We are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. What? What is that? What is this? This, I'll tell you what, this, this is a flawless description of Jesus. Flawless. It's a perfect description of Jesus and his death on the cross for you and me. And in fact, in, in the Hebrew here, it comes out in the perfect tense because there's no past tense in the Hebrew. But here in the Hebrew, it's perfect tense, often called prophetic perfect tense. You say, what's that? And why does that matter? Well, what it means is that it's stated as though it already has occurred, even though it is 700 years before the coming of Jesus Christ. You say, well, pastor, what does this underscore? I'll tell you what it underscores. The absolute certainty of the cross of Jesus Christ. Why? Because the death and resurrection of Christ was set in eternity past. So, Jim, what does this then say about history? It says the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is actually the hinge point of all history. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the pinnacle of all history. It's the zenith of all history. It is the center point of all history and all of eternity. And we said, well, why has God made it so? I'll tell you why. He loves us. He loves us with an eternal love. He, he saw us before you and I were made. We're knit together in our mother's womb, the handiwork, his handiwork. It is because he loves us. His perfect, holy, eternal love for you and for me is now seen for all of us through the eyes of faith, seen perfectly in the real and true coming of his one and only son, Jesus Christ, where he left heaven, took on a human flesh and blood body just like ours, Only Jesus never, ever once sinned. Ultimately, he went to a Roman cross where he died, bled out, and he rose from the grave. And this is all in place, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, because it's God saying, I love you. I love you so much. I can't bear the thought 
of you being away from me, lost in eternity, gone forever. I can't bear the thought of you being gone into hell. I will do everything that it takes to make you right with me because I love you. I love you. I am compelled to leave heaven itself and give all of me for you so that we can be together and you can be free forever. And you no longer have to be in the bondage of sin. You no longer have to be in the bondage of darkness. This is my life for you. I love you. You don't deserve it, and I give it all to you. I know you don't deserve it, but I just give it all to you because I love you. 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 Why is this God's greatest gift for us? I tell you, because the full weight and debt of all of our sin, every single one of them, was placed on Christ at the cross. In fact, let's look briefly at John chapter 19, verses 28, 29, and 30. We're seeing the last moments of the death of Jesus Christ, and so it's important for us to keep in mind what has happened up until this point. What has happened up until this point is that Jesus has been beaten, and Jesus has been flogged, and it's interesting, the the flogging that accompanied crucifixion is unique. And so if you were, if you happen to be there watching as Jesus was beaten and then flogged, Uh, you would recognize that Jesus is barely recognizable. In fact, if you were there watching what happened to Jesus as he was towards the end of his flogging, it's very likely that you've been sick to your stomach. I mean, so sick to the point that you'd have to turn away. And I'll tell you why. Because flogging towards crucifixion left strips of flesh dangling out. The, the hooks that would, they would take hold of flesh and rip it from the bone. Flesh and blood, muscle fiber, all those nerve endings being totally exposed. And again, you, you watching, seeing this happen to your Jesus at this moment in time, you would have been absolutely sick. So Jesus did this for us. Jesus was beaten. Jesus was flogged to the point where he was uh, not recognizable. And then he, Jesus, the only one, as we've noted, the only one who's ever lived a perfectly just and holy and righteous and sinless life, this same Jesus, he then was laid out on a Roman cross. And Jesus was nailed to that cross. With each beat of the hammer spurted blood from his veins. The cross was then hoisted and put into position where Jesus was left to die, to bleed out, to suffocate in a criminal's death. Six hours later, as Jesus was rising in the agony and the pain, certainly physically, as to what he's going through, but also think about it from the spiritual standpoint. He is suffering, he is feeling the weight of the debt of sin, all of the world's sin, every evil, all of the world's guilt being placed there upon Jesus at the cross. And as this is happening, then we move to verse 28, 29. 30. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. Verse 29, a jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. Folks, I want you to know that this is in fulfillment to Psalm 22, verse 15, and it's the fulfillment of Psalm 69, verse 21. And then we have verse 30. It says, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Circle that phrase, it is finished. 
Look at that phrase. Underline it. It is a translation of a Greek word, tetelestai. Tetelestai is an important word because it was used in ancient times in connection with the payment of a debt. Often, receipts were issued, given, where somebody would write or they would stamp on that receipt. Tetelestai. And what it means is paid in full. So why here? Why? Why here? Jesus, final breaths. Bearing all of the sin of the world that's ever been. All sin, the fallenness of humankind, everybody, every single one of our sins being placed upon Jesus. And why, why here, Tetelestai? It is because Jesus paid the debt in full. Take that in for a moment. Not one sin was left out. Not one. Not one lustful thought. Not one lie. Not one was left out. Whose debt? It was your debt. It was my debt. It's the world's debt. The entirety of the debt of sin and guilt paid for for all time. And only Jesus as the divine son of God could actually do this. No one else could. No one. But Jesus did do this. His shed blood once and for all, given at the cross, is eternally perfect in paying the debt for our sin. This, by the way, was a debt that separated us from the very God who loves us. The blood of Jesus Christ wiped away that debt away forever. The blood of Jesus Christ is what can be described as perfect atonement because its effect is forever. In other words, the blood of Jesus Christ washes us now. It'll wash us in the future. It'll wash, it'll wash you and me 10,000 years from now. Think of this. 20,000 years from now. A million years from now. The blood of Jesus Christ washes us forever. We are in his life. Hebrews 13.20. This is fascinating. Hebrews 13.20 shows us, it reveals just how perfect the blood is of Jesus Christ is. And it does so in connection with his resurrection. Look look at this verse here. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep. So what? Wait a minute. Did I hear that right? The God, that's the God of peace, Brought back from the dead, that's Jesus, our Lord and great shepherd. God raised him, says the verse. He brought him back from the dead. What? Through the blood of the eternal covenant? Yes. This is exactly what it says. What then does this mean? It means that the sacrifice of Christ, the work of all works, which will never be outdone and never be undone. His holy shed blood, his once and for all atonement is so complete, so perfect, so eternally comprehensive that it accomplished everything, all that we will ever need in the now and the forever more. And God, God the Father, is so satisfied with the work of God the Son that he rose God the Son. He rose Jesus from the dead because of the blood. I need to point out that Jesus Christ merited your salvation. He bought your salvation with his very blood. Yes, this is exactly what it says. Through the blood of the eternal covenant, God rose Jesus from the dead. God the Father rose God the Son from the dead. One of the ways that we can think about this very verse is to think about sonic booms. I, I'm still, man, I've loved Sonic Boom since I was, since I was like 11 years old. I'm, every time it went off, this is so cool. And, and now I'm 56 years old, and I'm in the backyard, Sonic Boom goes off. I'm like, oh, this is the coolest thing in the world. I can't get over it. They're just cool. 
because you've got this jet and it's just moving along and soon as it hits 768 miles per hour, boom! Sound barrier is broken and yes, it is cool and you can hear it. One of the ways to think of, by way of illustration as to what's going on in this particular verse is the resurrection of Jesus Christ is God the Father's sonic boom for the penetrating work of the, of the cross of the Son of God. That's way cool. That's way cooler. That's right. Amen. It sure is. So we really do rightly infer that our most glorious Heavenly Father, God the Father, looked upon the shed blood of Jesus, His Son, and said, that's it. That's it. We did it. You did it. We did it. This is exactly the way we planned from before time began. This is exactly the way we planned it before it all happened in all history, Jesus. This is it. Rise, my son. Rise from the grave. It has accomplished everything we need for your bride, for those who are going to believe in you and be saved. It's all there, Jesus. It's all there for project redemption. It occurred to me this morning, I'm thinking, Lord, how do we end this message? What do we, how, do, how do we draw this to a conclusion? And one of the thoughts that I had was if, if God is this well pleased with the blood of Jesus Christ that saves you and washes you forever, why do we strive? Why are we given to so much strife? Why, why is it that we don't rest? with great confidence in this perfect sacrifice? Why is it we don't want to just yield? Why don't we just enjoy what God has given us? That's, that's the first thought that I had. And the second thing that I know I need to do on a day like today is we need to give a time, a moment. And really two decisions are in play. Number one, for the person who has never, not once, trusted Jesus Christ, trusted this perfect blood that was shed for you, before you took your first breath, God gave it to you. And it's there for you, but you must believe. You must turn to him, and you must allow Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life. And if you do this personally, in your heart with him for real, he will for real rescue you forever. He will accompany that decision in his very presence, his very own presence in the Holy Spirit. If you place your faith, if you believe in Jesus Christ, and allow him to be Lord of your heart and life, He'll wash you. He'll cleanse you forever. You'll walk out of here a trans, transformed individual, a new creation. So we've got to have a moment for that. That's most important. But then I think for, for uh, 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 the rest of us who believed in the Lord, what a moment it is for us to rest our faith with great confidence in the blood that was shed. To enjoy the Lord. To give thanks for this gift that saves you forever. Let's pray in those two ways, right here, right now. I'd ask everybody to bow your head, close your eyes. Lord, it is so amazing that you see our hearts, you know our hearts. You knew how this message would go before it was ever spoken. Lord, we also recognize you put it in place. It was you, Holy Spirit. And Lord, how you search our hearts and how you know our hearts and how you are speaking to individuals right here, right now. And if you know that God is speaking to you, the word for you is to, to receive it, to say, yes, Lord, to let go. We all have pride, but at this point, it's time to humble yourself. Let go of your human pride. You say, well, I can't understand. You don't have to understand. It is so much bigger than your mind can even perceive of, as is the Lord, the Lord himself. There's no possible way that he can be confined to your mind. He's God. But his personal presence is there for you right here, right now, in this one decision. And it is the decision to put your trust in Jesus Christ, who rose from the dead, having given you the gift of all gifts, the greatest gift you could ever receive, total forgiveness, being made right with the Father forever, heaven then is your promise, and have abundant life 
everlasting life starting now. And so right here at the threshold of that line, in your own heart, in your own words, I'd ask that you would pray to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, your personal rescuer. And Lord, we're all so incredibly grateful that you've come. Thank you so much for taking every one of our sins there, how you absorbed it like a divine sponge so that we can be clean forever through you, Jesus. Lord, I pray that all of us will walk out of here today with mountain-moving faith, that all of us will be about your exploits, the kingdom exploits, that all of us will have this joy that will never go away. Because of you, Jesus, because you rose from the grave. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.